Welcome. This is Chapter 15, Surveillance and Outbreak Investigation. Much like epidemiology, I hope that you watch the epidemiology or listen to video first um, and look to those PowerPoints and read that chapter. It will be helpful for you to do that before you do this one because some of the concepts overlap and if you don't have those other ones down, this one will be much more difficult to understand. So um, once again, it, according you know, with the other, other book, um, chapter was talking about kind of the history. You will not need to know about the history, but um, do know that public health protections was started kind of from the bubonic plague, which happened in Europe, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people died. And at that time, there was no idea of germ theory, and people didn't really know what was happening. So um, there was a long way and a lot of knowledge that needs to, to happen. Um, the United States has had a very active role in public health and finding public health policies and policing power in terms of being able to um, investigate and try to reduce disease within our United States. Disease surveillance is the ongoing systematic collection analysis, inter interpretation and dissemination of specific health data for public health. Surveillance is important because it generates knowledge of disease or outbreaks, including timing, geography, distribution, and suspected populations. Um, so one of the things that we sur um, sur survey, I don't say surveillance, but really survey, um, in terms of nursing is um, immunizations and kids' disease-related to immunizations. Um, states are required to look at things like um, whooping cough, um, part of should be covered in the MMR. Many kids are not having the tests. Actually, uh, pertussis is, yeah, um, DPT. Um, many kids are not getting the infection um, protection that they need through the injections, through those immunizations. And so um, in Washington State this last month, we just had a huge, huge, an um, outbreak of pertussis, which is whooping cough, and in children did suffer and even die from it um, because they were not covered. Um, and that's something we look at and we try to figure out what's going on. And the recommendation to the state of Idaho and the well, state of Oregon, everyone around, including Washington, was get your immunizations because as those diseases coming out, people are more at risk. Um, public health surveillance can include to estimate the magnitude of the disease, and you'll see, you know, how many people out of 100,000 get this or that disease. That's surveillance. Determining geographic distribution of illnesses and symptoms, like I mentioned in Chapter 9, um, multiple sclerosis is more likely in the northern regions of the United States. So why is that? Um, skin cancer, though, is more prevalent in the south, so um, that's not too hard to figure out. And specific, more, some states are more likely to have it than others. So that's part of the surveillance. Looking at the natural history of disease, what happens when a person gets it? If they get treatment, if they don't, don't get treatment, do they get better? Do they get worse? Do they stay the same? Um, are, so are the treatments effective? Um, ep detecting epidemics. Um, and finding out what those are. Remember a few years ago that that whole bird flu thing was a big deal and that, that got epidemiologists and public health people really wound up. And it wasn't going to get here. Swine flu was definitely a biggie. Um, epidemic down in Mexico, not really so much here, but um, protecting the United States by monitoring who's coming in and that sort of thing is really, really important. Generating a hypothesis and, stimu and stimulating um, research. Surveillance, um, public health information can help identify what's going on in terms of research and making changes. Evaluate control measures, so are things we're doing helping or not? Monitoring changes in infection, infectious agents. Um, there are ways to kind of um, look at a virus and a bacteria and see if there are changes within those viruses. Um, it's like kind of like each organism has a fingerprint and they can look to see does that fingerprint change um, and that's one of the reasons they could find out like with the swine flu down to the child in the village of where that all started because of the virus and the fingerprint and way of the virus because um, it, it can be detected and followed. So they can 
tech, deep tech changes in health practices. For example, in the United States, um, obesity is becoming a big issue. And um, so why is that happening? And what can we do? And, and that moves on to facilitating planning. So um, it is a problem. So what do we do now? In terms of health, um, we can also look at identifying trends and unusual disease patterns. If something different came, why? How did it get here? Um, deciding on priorities for scarce resources. You know, there might be a disease that is um, very um, deadly, but maybe not very contagious and fairly rare. And you know, whether to pot, put a pile of money into that disease or not is something that the public health can can give some um, give some ideas about. If it's a a low incidence disease, that's not going to be a priority unless it's really contagious and really deadly. So um, that's some information that they can provide. Developing and evaluating programs for commonly occurring and universal occurring diseases or events. Oh, um, how do our STD clinics work? Are they working? Um, have they helped or not? And do they help in particular populations and maybe not others? Um, there needs to be collaboration among partners. We need to um, have the states, state agencies and federal government all working together to provide that data. And CDC does a great job, Center for Disease Control. Um, nurses are often at the forefront um, in responding and helping out with emergencies, particularly related to things like epidemics and immunization. Um, core competencies a nurse needs to have who works in surveillance, um, analytical assessment skills, figuring out, you know, helping diagnose what's going on. Is it TB? Is it asthma? Is it something else? Communicating, um, working in the community it is very important. Keep this in mind for testing that we go to, and in terms of identifying diseases and treating, we go to the people. We can't expect them to come to us. Um, particularly people that might be homeless, might have limited resources um, related to money or language. Basic public health science skills are needed and leadership and system thinking skills, how to get everyone to work together. Um, Minnesota has a really great um, public health intervention program and that's something you, if you want to go into this area you might want to look into. Also, um, sources of data for surveillance. We can look at specific cases. Maybe um, look at a doctor's office and might have a, a large number of a specific disease or a health agency. We can also look at labs. What kind of lab tests are they doing and how many positives do they have on a particular lab test? Is that number changing? Death certificates to help. Um, you know, a lot of times it's hard to figure out exactly what's going on with a death certificate. Um, like, you know, just was reading the paper about the wife of um, one of the pilots who got killed in 9-11. Um, she just died, quote, of natural causes of, at age 52. She was healthy one day, she was dead the next. I don't know what that means, Hel um, natural causes. I would imagine it was some sort of massive heart attack or maybe stroke. Um, but at least it can give a little bit of information in the death records. Um, administrative data such as billing, looking at insurance and what our insurance company is paying for, um, that can provide some information, um, but that is limited. So lots of different data from lots, lots of sources. Um, there is a notification of infectious disease. There are diseases that have to be reported and it's part of the role of the um, health clinic and the nurse may be involved in that to actually lit, um, find those diseases and make sure that that information is provided to the U.S. government. And for you who have the current edition of the book, that is on page 275, there um, will not be any test questions specifically about which disease is on it, but it is interesting to know which ones are required. And so one could find statistics on all of those, and that includes like Lyme disease, malaria, mumps, pertussis, talking about whooping cough, um, rabies, rubella, syphilis, um, tularemia, it's also called rabbit, wild rabbit fever, um, and yellow fever along with varicella. So those are just some of many different diseases. Um, there, so there are requirements. It's mandated by law to report this information and unfortunately not all states report and report well in all um, counties, but um, I'm hoping that that will improve. In terms of 
um, types of surveillance systems. This, and I would know this term passive system, is this reporting of what's going on, um, these, these basic diseases like I'm telling you. And it also might also include um, some other health diseases, health problems like heart disease, but mainly this kind of reporting of um, infectious diseases is a, the passive system. An active system is a little bit different in that a nurse or a public he um, health employee might go out and specifically look up a particular case or cases and contact them. So they're kind of going specifically for a particular problem um, versus just putting in information slowly. In healthcare, you'll hear people talk about a sentinel system. Um, sentinel means kind of big or uh, it's kind of like a big deal. Um, you'll hear talk in the hospital about a sentinel event. Sentinel event is a term in which um, is used when something really horrible happened that wasn't expected and there needs to be a report about that. Um, in healthcare too, there might be a real key health event that um, comes out and there's a sentinel system to help report that information. There might be also special systems in, in addition. Um, these are not terms that you're going to need to know, but they're, um, we might hear a little about it when we go to the American Red Cross. Investigations. Uh, when what happens, you need to find out what is the objective. Usually it's to find you know, what's going on with the disease, but it might be to find out you know, the mode of transport, transmission um, in terms of how did all these people get the disease and you know, where is it starting. We're going to look at the magnitude of problem, the patterns of occurrence, the causal factors from an epidemiological triangle. Remember that from last, from the other chapter, chapter nine. And then another thing to think is when to investigate. You know, sometimes some odd diseases come up, but um, and it might be reported. But it's like, well, is it worth spending time and energy on? Um, maybe not. Interventions. Um, there are a lot of interventions that um, might be related to and might be related to bioterrorism or large um, scale infection. There might be quarantines, isolations, um, seizing even property. Mandatory vaccinations is a little different, but um, travel restrictions are very possible and um, there might be some limits on disposing of, de of disease too when there's a serious illness going on a problem. Um, we do need to think about protecting health care workers uh, in terms of what's going on um, and are we providing adequate uh, protection for ourselves in terms of a disease um, that might be risky. Well, that's it. I hope that was helpful and you've learned some things about surveillance. And if you have any questions, let me know and I look forward to hearing from you. Bye now.